Hello everyone, good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Live at the Waterhole. We're first up, we're at the Vic Falls Safari Lodge and the Vulture Restaurant. My name is Ralph Kirsten and what does the bush hold in store for us today? Well, you'll have to sit back, relax and watch as the animals come down to quench their thirst and cool off. And as per usual, please don't forget that this is a live and interactive experience, so we'd love for you to jump on board with us and send us through your questions and your comments. You can do that by going on the Wild Earth website and registering. You can also join the conversation on X, formerly known as Twitter, using the hashtag Wild Earth. What is it that you'd like to see? What would you like to chat about? Whatever it is wildlife related, send it on through. And here we can see all of the vultures, the marabou stalks, and everybody getting ready for feeding time. So we'll just wait for the very brave guide to come on out and give them their meat. And you will see they're pretty much like sardines. It just, um, it really goes fast and it's a feeding frenzy. So they'll slowly but surely be getting bigger in numbers and then get ready for the attack. Now it looks to be a lovely sunny hot day, but uh, with that being said, let's go and have a look what the weather's going to be like across all the different locations. It seems like a little bit of a mixed bag. There's uh, sunny spots, there's also rainy spots and overcast weather. So they're not uh, going to be experiencing any cool weather here though at Vic Falls. Nice and hot, mid 30s or so. It's a fantastic day. The animals will obviously be getting a little bit agitated now waiting for their one o'clock meal. You'll see white-backed vultures are probably the most dominant species here and then uh, hooded vultures there might be some white-headed vultures in amongst them as well the odd leopard faced vulture and then there's the marabou stalks too the old grim reaper or the undertakers as we like to call them So first comment we got coming through from Michelle saying hi Ralph love to see the action here lovely to have you on board Michelle and yeah wait for the action maybe they're just waiting for all the tourists to get up onto the viewing platform before they throw the meat out but the vultures sure are gathering Might see a bit of squabbling between them as well once the meat gets thrown out. Everybody trying to get a piece of the action. And of course, we often get questions from viewers and guests about these kind of vulture restaurants. What's the purpose of it and so on? And um, well, it's because of the plight of these particular birds. And uh, well, there's a lot of poisoning that goes on from poachers and from indiscriminate use of chemicals from farmers. But let's watch. Here comes the meat. And away they go. Just 
look at that, that's incredible. And some dragging off and being chased by the rest. The marabou stalks don't really seem to get much out of it. They're uh, quite a bit taller than the vultures, and so they're a bit above the action. They're trying their best nonetheless. And Soul Shatter PWI saying nice to spend time with you again, Ralph. Lovely to have you on board, Soul Shatter. And Ants saying it's a feed in frenzy. Absolutely. It's like a bunch of flies, really. And it doesn't last long. It's just a bit of a snack to help them, you know, get through the days. Not really trying to feed them per se. Just helping them along. So Mrs. Ferret asking, is there enough meat for all of them to get some? Not really, Mrs. Ferret. Um, and as I say, it's not really the point of these kind of restaurants. It's not really to feed them per se, as I mentioned. Um, it's just a little bit of an assist. So not everybody's going to get some each time, but uh, the ones that obviously keep fighting for a little piece will get some. And it's just a bit of a helping hand. Mark Johnston asking what type of vultures are they? Predominantly white-backed vultures. The bigger ones that we're seeing here are all white-backs. Um, and then there's the hooded vulture, which you can see it's got... They, they're smaller birds. Um, and it, their heads are a lot smaller as well. And there's white-headed vultures that look very similar to the hooded vultures. But... Um, there only be a couple of them. They're not quite as common as the hooded vulture. And then those marabou stalks, they're the ones that stand a lot taller, have got much longer legs and a much bigger bill. And it's a very straight bill as well. It's not um, hooked like the vultures per se. So they're not really able to cut into the meat and tear it. They just literally grab a piece and swallow the whole thing down. And just like that, there was pretty much nothing left. Obviously, you do see the individuals that as soon as the meat comes out, one or two of them will grab a piece and try and get away from the rest of them. But it's not really possible. There's just too many. And that's when you see them sort of moving off in different directions. 
everybody just trying to steal it all for themselves. It's pretty much every man for himself. Bit of squabbling going on there. Further up. Wings outstretched. Bit of a fight going on now. Oh, the Marabou Stork off there on the right has just got himself a big piece, but I think the Vultures have come in, in and taken it off him. Now there's still a couple of pieces of meat going around. Obviously they've got to pull it off the bone. So it does help that uh, it's not as easy to get the meat but it does get shared around a bit more. And some already starting to move off. But others still fighting over the scraps. You can see what I mean there with the marabou storks having much longer legs and a higher center of gravity than the vultures. It does make it a bit more difficult for them. So as quickly as the action starts and the chaos ensues, quiet has resumed. A couple of little pieces I think still around, that's what they're all just walking around looking out for. So Adam asking what other birds are popular here, well as we can see it's pretty much dominated by these vultures and um, it's all centered around this vulture restaurant as we call them. But we can hear some other birds. I've heard some blue wax balls, a very high pitched little squeak. And listening out still, sounds like there may be a green backed Camaroptera. Doo, 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 doo. But I think most of the birds will be getting out of the way of these raptors and this meat that's getting eaten. All right, now that the action has subsided, I think uh, time for us to move on and uh, let's change of country uh, completely. Let's head to Kenya and Old Donio. A 
And we've got a nice view on some Maasai giraffe. They're just underneath the umbrella thorn, off to the right of this little waterhole, which is very well visited by elephants, giraffe, lots of different birds. And sometimes during different periods, we get lots of zebra, earlunt, fringe-eared oryx, impala, uh, the yellow baboons. And so just a lovely waterhole, this. And yesterday we watched uh, the highlights of when uh, th there was an incident with an elephant bull that was uh, in must. And he maimed a, a bull giraffe, seemingly for no reason. Um, but the reason behind is uh, that he's in must um, and 60 times the levels of testosterone of a normal uh, individual. So he literally would fight with just about anything. And unfortunately, that giraffe got in his way. And we have had reports that the giraffe, as a result, has died, um, which is sad. But uh, I wonder the feast that ensued there. As you can imagine, you saw those vultures in the show the meat out there. Uh, it will be quite similar when a giraffe dies. As soon as the scavengers and the opportunists realize that there's meat about, there would have been everything from hyenas to lions to jackals and caracal, whatever else. Um, as well as the vultures. So we don't quite have a view on the area where that animal died, but I can just imagine the chaos that is happening there now. So and Ants was saying, look at that little one. Yeah, it was a bit of a smaller giraffe there, but nothing small about these guys. Yeah, at the waterhole itself. All with beautiful tusks. I don't think any of these is our individual called One Ton, but uh, they are beautiful individuals nonetheless. The Old Boys Club. Hopefully nobody's uh, in must here, otherwise we might see a bit of fighting. So, and we often get asked about elephant bulls and must um, you know, by viewers as well as guests and what is it all about? So I found a lovely little article on wildlifesos.org and they speak of everything you need to know about must. What is it? Must, which is M-U-S-T-H, is a completely natural phenomenon seen in healthy adult bull elephants, both tuskers and maknas or Tuskless bulls, I think that's an Indian term for them, generally characterized by the secretion of a hormone-rich substance called temperin from the temporal gland, and this comes on either side of the elephant's head, and a steady trickle of urine down the back legs of the elephant. It must involve a rise in the reproductive hormones in the elephant's body. And this causes the animal to feed more re feel more restless, energetic, aggressive, and unpredictable. Also generally irritable and oversensitive to sounds and movements. Must is seen in healthy adult bull elephants. How long does it last? Is the length and duration of must a sign of health? Must is a natural and healthy, healthy phenomenon in adult bull elephants. And if a bull elephant goes into must, it is generally considered a sign that he's healthy. And it typically lasts between two to three months and occurs in three stages. A so three to four week pre-must condition a four to five week peak must and a four to five week post must condition. 
For elephants in captivity, though, the condition and its duration can vary greatly. Deprivation of food and nutrition can cause the elephant to go into must less frequently and for shorter durations of time. For bull elephants that have easy access to nutritious food and are in good health, must can last much longer. And records of healthy bulls in captivity have shown them staying in must sometimes even more than a year. But in general, um, you know, with wild populations, if everything's going well, so it can be a little bit uh, changeable. Um, but generally healthy elephant bulls, uh, that's sort of the kind of flow that, that happens with them. So completely normal. Um, and it's this raising in testosterone is 60 times more the, level, the normal levels that um, really makes them aggressive and want to fight with just about anything. And you'll see the other individuals that understand what must is about. They can probably smell it and see from the body language as we do as humans. And as guides, we need to pick this up because we need to avoid those big guys because they'll look for a fight with you as well. So... It's important just to know that, and the elephants know all too well to keep clear of a bull in must, especially if it's a big adult like one of these guys. So generally when you see these individuals like this, you would assume that none of them are in must because there would uh, otherwise be agitation and aggression between them as well. So, and Ants also saying those tusks look sharp. Yeah, they're reasonably sharp. I mean, they are rounded on the end. But as we saw with that uh, bull that attacked the giraffe, um, with the force that gets pushed behind it, it, it very quickly turns into a kind of a spike. So, yeah, even though it's not extremely sharp, um, it can be made as such just with the force that comes from these big animals.
Now, Stephen Rousseau has asked, is it true that elephants in must secrete a foul-smelling secretion? And to answer that, Stephen, um, I quote from Wikipedia, and they speak of the elephants in must and the secretions. The elephants in must often discharge a thick, tar-like secretion called temperin from the temporal ducts on the sides of the head. And that's uh, just behind the eye. Um, so you can very often see it. It's not only when they're in must, so it's not a telltale sign that they are in must. It's that uh, leaking behind the back legs. But temperin contains proteins, lipids, notably cholesterol, phenol, and 4-methylphenol, cresols, and ses sesquiterpenes, notably farnesol and its derivatives. The secretions and urine collected from zoo elephants have been shown to contain elevated levels of variously highly odorous ketones and aldehydes. And the elephant's aggression may be partially caused by a reaction to the temperin, which naturally trickles down into the elephant's mouth. Another contributing factor may be the accompanying swelling of the temporal glands, which actually presses on the elephant's eyes and causes acute pain comparable to severe toothache. Elephants sometimes try to counteract this pain by digging their tusks into the ground. And I've seen many elephants actually doing this, bulls, when they're in must. Um, and I always thought it was just out of pure anger and aggression. But this now makes a lot of sense in that they're actually in pain. But to answer your question, Stephen, you can literally smell when an elephant's in must. Sometimes you don't even see them. You just smell them. And I've had this uh, both on vehicle and on foot many times. Obviously, when on foot... Um, it's, it's, it's a real eye-opener because uh, you want to get out of the area. So it's a real, it's quite nice to remember because elephants in must smell really musky. It's a musky smell that you get and it's really pungent. And it's obviously down to this, um, these different proteins, lipids and phenols and all of that, with all their derivatives, etc. So... Must is linked to sexual arousal or establishing dominance, but this relationship is far from clear. Wild bulls in must often produce a characteristic low, low pulsating rumbling noise, known as the must rumble, which can be heard by other elephants for considerable distances. And this rumble has been shown to prop, prompt not only attraction in the form of reply vocalizations from cows in heat, but also silent avoidance behavior from other bulls particularly younger or juveniles and non-receptive females. So this suggests an evolutionary benefit to advertising the actual must state of the bull. And a grisly outbreak in the 1990s of rogue elephants goring over a hundred rhinos to death without provocation in two national parks in South Africa was attributed to dysfunctional young males translocated survivors of incomplete or non-herd based culls of elephants at another overcrowded park, growing in the absence of older males and prematurely entering must. The South African ecologist and ranger Gus van Dijk, who thought of the idea of reintroducing older males into the park to prevent younger males from entering must, noted that no further rhinos killings were observed once these bigger bulls were introduced. And a must elephant, whether in the wild or otherwise, is extremely dangerous to both humans and other elephants, and obviously to other animals like giraffe as well. In zoos, bull elephants in must have killed keepers, um, as well as other bull males, female elephants and calves, in the last usually inadvertently or accidentally. In zoos keeping adult male elephants need strong purpose-built enclosures to isolate males during their must, which greatly complicates attempting to breed elephants in zoos. So most zoos that keep a single elephant or a small herd typically have only females for this precise reason. So 
There's no speaking sense to an elephant bull in must, and that's why we just generally try and avoid them um, and mimic the elephants themselves because that's exactly what they do. So Martin Bushmad was asking, why do some animals lap water and others sip or slurp? How do you differentiate the need? So actually, Martin, it's um, whether a species laps or, you know, sucks or slurps the water depends upon the shape of their mouths. Now, carnivores like cats and dogs will lap the water because they simply cannot form their large mouths to form a suction the way that elephants... Uh, do with their trunks. Obviously, they, they're very well adapted to drinking. Um, but also the likes of the antelope, uh, the giraffe, um, and all the other herbivores uh, do as well. And when we see with birds, and I often discuss about this, uh, certain groupings of birds that can literally drink water because they have a gullet. So they don't need to raise their head. And those groups are the doves and the pigeons and also the, the bustards. Um, they, they will drink with their head down. Um, and, and suck and swallow the water without having to raise the head. Whereas all the other birds don't have a gullet, so they need to literally scoop up water and pick their heads up so that it will go down. Now Gilroy1 was asking, do they pump water into that water hole? Yes, they do, Gilroy. There's a little spot just over on the left, near to where these two have uh, got their trunks intertwined. The water seems to come out of there. It might actually come out of two points um, over there on the right as well. It seems like they prefer those two exact spots. So normally when elephants do prefer a spot to drink from, it's where the fresh water is coming out because they are really water connoisseurs and prefer the nice clean fresh water um, than old stagnant water. If that's all that's available, of course they will drink it, but uh, they have a real preference for nice fresh water. And Uncle Earl saying four males in close proximity with large tusks, you never know what could happen. Absolutely, Uncle Earl, but um, with this kind of relaxed behavior, you can pretty much assume that none of them are in must, and when they're out of must, they are generally nice and relaxed. But uh, as you say, you never do know what's going to happen with wildlife. So Spaz Lankov asking, it's World Water Day as one of the most water-dependent animals in the bush. What do you think about the loss of natural water holes in the bush due to the effects of the climate? Um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult one, Spaz, because, um, you know, you speak of changing climate. No two days are the same. No two seasons are the same. Um, whether we're going through a period of, of heating, being uh, maybe a little bit closer to the sun, um, whatever it might be, uh, you know, these natural areas, there is natural springs, there, there is water availability for them, but um, it's nice to see that here next to the old Donio Lodge, that uh, they are bringing the water to the surface here and, and uh, have produced a permanent water hole for the animals and elephants really require a massive water um, amounts uh, on a daily basis so it's important to have a lot of, of water availability and that's pretty much um, what limits the populations of elephants is literally the water availability secondary being the food um, but primarily the water. If there's good permanent water availability, the elephants will always do well in these natural areas. And if they're not able to migrate, well then we need to, as um, the people that have enforced the enclosure of the elephants, we need to supply them with good water. Normally pumped from underground, from boreholes, 
and uh, then supplied on the surface. And a lot of the water holes that we go to um, it would be natural, but a lot of them would be seasonally, um, you know, full of water. So what they've just done is because we've uh, enclosed them, contained them, we now just maintain those water holes as permanent as well. But yes, we, we have fluctuations in rainfall, sometimes higher than average, sometimes lower than average. We'll go through periods of drought, we'll also go through periods of uh, excessive rainfall and flooding. So, you know, with a lot of these species, it's just about the, um, how well they are able to adapt to change. And that's um, how evolution occurs. It's change over time and they need to adapt to changes in the environment. Um, as well as the next species. So it's those species that can adapt to the change and survive through the difficult periods that will sustain their populations. There seem to be a little bit of a disagreement there for some other reason. Not quite sure we, what went on, but uh, something happening between them here. And this is another individual arriving. I'm not quite sure. So Ant's asking, uh, Ralph, have you ever been chased or otherwise on the receiving end of an elephant in must? Yes, many times, Ant. Um, sometimes wittingly, sometimes unwittingly, mostly unwittingly, that I've just bumped into an elephant that's in must. And uh, those are the times when it's the sort of the scariest because, um, you know, driving through, turn, a, you come around a, a thicket area or whatever, and he has this elephant in front of you, and as you see him, you realize that he's in must and he's already coming at you. So I've had to evade many elephants on vehicles, mostly, uh, but we've also had to escape from elephants on foot as well. Most notably up in Makuleki, or the Pafuri region of the Crater Kruger National Park. Um, and we've been lucky that in those instances we've been pretty close to sort of copies or um, a little bit of uh, hillside and rocks that we've been able to clamber up onto the rocks and get some height uh, and get away from the bull that was pursuing us uh, and i've had to do that a couple of times trees aren't really useful in getting away from elephants because um you know obviously they can just push the tree over so that's that's something that we do use when we're on foot and we get surprised by black rhino uh, or buffalo um, and i've had um, students and and uh, guests up trees 
uh, and have some wonderful encounters with the likes of elephant and rhino uh, from that nice height and position with the animals running around below still trying to get at us but um, never use that method with elephants because it is of no use so luckily being nearby to you know areas where we could get up and away from the elephant but uh, one of the encounters that I did have was actually just recently, um, a few months ago, on a Makala game reserve. And I had one of the bulls that uh, I drove towards him. I saw him from a distance and I drove near to him. And uh, as he saw me, about uh, between 50 and 80 meters away, he sort of turned from his feeding and immediately came towards the vehicle. So I switched the vehicle off and here he came all the way towards us and the way that he was walking i could already see that he was in must or at least coming into it um and i mentioned that on the show on i think it was the sunset safari um, and he came right up to the vehicle and i spoke to him in a stern but relaxed voice um, and he came up to the side of the vehicle where the cameraman was um, and he actually put his tusks in under the little ridge of the buck is what we call it at the back of the land rover so he, he just hooked his tusks underneath that and he lifted up the side of the vehicle at which time i just hit on this banged on the side of the land rover and shouted at him um, to which he got a little bit of a surprise um, he put the vehicle back down and off he strolled and ever since that little altercation that i've had that i had with him every time i've seen him after that and he hears my voice he ignores me so i think uh, he doesn't like the words that I said to him. But anyway, that's uh, what's required sometimes. So it is possible to turn some of the elephants when they are even in must. But there are some very strong-headed individuals that just won't be turned and need to be avoided completely. But um, yeah, each encounter is different and you've got to be really careful with uh, the bulls when they are going through this period of 60 times the normal levels of testosterone. Can you just imagine? Looks like a superb starling just sneaking a little drink in there on the right hand side. I think it is a starling. Quite a number of little birds coming in. There might be some cutthroat finches in amongst them. There's an emerald spotted wood dove. There's often the macqua doves as well that come through.
So Soul Shatter PWI um, saying it would be so cool if there was a way to listen to the elephant communications that are outside of our hearing range on these live cameras. Yes, Soul Shatter, um, absolutely, it would be incredible. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure what this kind of audio devices uh, would look like or how much they would cost, etc. Um, but how interesting would that be if we could actually hear what these guys are talking about? I'm sure that there's a lot going on. Um, and I think probably up to, you know, I would definitely say the majority of what they're saying and the noises they're making that we can't hear. So if only we could have that, that would be incredible. Now, some people may have seen on social media, there was a video that went viral recently of um, an elephant that uh, accosted a game viewer, but it was one of these uh, bigger game viewers, um, a Toyota Diner, I believe, uh, and this can seat uh, anything, I think, between 20 and 30 people in the back. So it's quite a commercial game viewer, uh, and this was in the Pilonsberg, and um, unfortunately for the guide, I think he came across um, a elephant bull in must and the bull elephant um, you know if if anybody has ever been to the Pilansberg and some commercial areas of the Greater Kruger Park they do have these big commercial game viewers um, and sometimes the activity and the behavior of the guides is uh, very untoward especially in these vehicles because it's a little bit of a sausage factory and people are just racing to get to sightings you know people come for day safaris um, or, you know, they don't have much time, so they want to try and get in as much as possible. So it's a bit of a Ferrari safari and driving from sighting to sighting. Um, and what we call Jeep jockeys. 
And so these guys are, you know, moving through the bush at pace uh, and they do irritate the elephants a lot. I've seen it in person. I've seen it many times. Um, and I think sometimes the elephants have enough. And uh, I think in this particular instance, this elephant uh, just got w one, one back for himself. Um, I'm sure that he's been irritated many times by those uh, kind of game viewers. And they, I've seen that they don't like that particular type of game viewers as well. So he lifted up the front of the vehicle. The guide is shouting and hitting the side of the vehicle. Um, the elephant just with such ease lifted the entire front of the truck uh, and threw it in the air, bounced back down. Um, and he was none, having none of what the guide was shouting at him. Uh, and he did it again. Eventually, the guide actually had to back up from there. Nobody was hurt in the incident, um, but it has been going around. Uh, and I'm sure that there would be some questions surrounding this. That's my take on it. Um, and I've seen that elephants, they do have a level of, um, you know, taking nonsense from, from guides. I've seen it in many different game reserves. And eventually, they do get enough. And um, they react accordingly, especially once they go into must as well. As you can imagine, with that uh, much testosterone and an irritation comes past that you've been meaning to have a word with uh, on many occasions. And those are going to be the days that they're going to do it. So I think that was it. I don't think it's a problem animal in any way whatsoever. I think more the problem animal is um, those kind of commercial game drives where it's... Uh, it's, it's, it's just a race to get to the different sightings. Yes, it still does have a big economic input. Um, but, and you know, those are, those are quite cheap safaris as well. So it does then allow the general public and, and locals to be able to go and see those animals. But yeah, the elephants do um, have a level of understanding. And once that's gone, then they take it out on it. So that's, what, that's all that happened there and nobody was hurt. So, and Anz was saying uh, that uh, those two on the right seem to have been having a private conversation. Yeah, it looked like it, eh, Anz? And now it looks like uh, the three of them have dis disappeared off together and left this one on his own. Probably definitely say that this elephant is left tusked, with that one on the left being well worn compared to the one on the right. And here comes a Maasai giraffe to come and join this solitary elephant bull. Seemingly not in must, hopefully. And let's hope that he doesn't accost this giraffe. But I would say he's happy-go-lucky and he's not in must, so it shouldn't be a problem. But we can also understand now why the giraffe are so nervous next to the waterhole. I think I may have mentioned it earlier, but... Uh, yeah, lots of people always asking why they're so nervous. The elephants are always just so relaxed. Well, it just takes one incident to remind us why.
So the ox pickers have just flown down from the giraffe and uh, taking a drink. They're not quite as scared of the elephant as the giraffe is. So they don't need to be as patient. But I think that giraffe is hanging off on the right. I'm going to wait for his chance. See, there might just be a little bit of a slow trickle, which you can actually see there where that elephant's trunk has been. So I think it's just slowly extracting the water as it's being pumped out into this water hole. Right, so we've um, just had a couple of guest uh, speakers on, on the show in the last couple of days, with, uh, all to do with the Wild Water Campaign. And today being Wild Water Day, it's uh, culminating. Um, so we have another guest on today, and the, this time it is Nicola Gerard from Love Africa Marketing. And she'll be joining us. Hello, Nicola, and uh, welcome on the show. Hello, Rolf. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for having me. So, Nicola, you come from Love Africa Marketing. Do you want to tell us a little bit of a background there and what exactly you guys do? So, yeah, we are in South Africa, um, in in most of our community in Durban, KZN, uh, or KwaZulu which is on the east of South Africa and it's a small team and we are a marketing and communications company that specializes in conservation and awareness across Africa and then in tourism as well so basically two sectors tourism and conservation and we do all things communication strategy um, film and um, marketing. So very, very, very passionate about that. And um, yeah, basically looked at my passions in life and thought, how can I, how can I make a business out of this? <laughs> how can I basically make, make sure that I don't work, feel like work every day? Um, and, and for Africa and tourism and, and and conservation and and i managed to have a really nice team to join me in that so um yeah thanks for having me this of all your live sessions and your game drives through the world. um yeah that's us all right thanks for that nicola um just a little bit of issues on your audio so i think uh, they're just going to try and sort that out and we'll get you back as soon as that's uh, fixed up
Now, we saw that Turaco here again, and I've seen it for the last few days. Now, there, I think there's three Turacos that occur in Kenya, being the Hartlaub's Turaco, uh, the Great Blue, and then the Black Build. I think, I'm not 100% sure, you know, I'm not as clued up with the East uh, African birds um, as the Southern African, but I think it may have been a Black Build. We'll try and get a closer look the next time one of those little beautiful birds, well, they're not very little actually, comes into frame. So this bull really taking his time now. I think um, previously when all the others were here, it was all about discussions and what's going on in the environment around him and uh, whatever other conversations were to be had. And now he's getting down to the important business of having a drink. All right, so it seems like behind the scenes, the technical guys have sorted out Nicola's audio. So we'll welcome her back. And um, Nicola, I'd like to ask you a little bit about your clients that you do have at Love Africa Marketing. I see that um, you guys do represent the Rhino Army, the Project Rhino, uh, Blood Lions, Ranger Protect, and most notably, and um, with our water in mind, Ocean Impact and Wild Oceans. So could you tell us a little bit about the work that you do for these guys and um, exactly how that all comes together? Hi, sorry about the technical issue. I hope you did me a little bit better now. Um, yeah, so basically we, like I said, we, we do work on the communication side of conservation and environment and tourism and travel across Africa and so we have clients or partners across Africa um, probably a, a large part of what we do is the dental side of things environmental awareness and KSE and one of our clients in particular is a dental NGO in South Africa called Wild Trust and they do um, a number of arms. They've got the terrestrial side, and then they've got the um, ocean and then estuaries side of what they do. Um, and they've got the one side or under the marine side is our three campaigns um, called Shark Center Attack and ocean impacts and then on the brink so in particular which is interesting um a really hot topic from the environmental things at the moment is, is ocean impact uh which looks at marine protected areas across south africa um looking at um where and, and, and basically measuring, you know, how much are we consuming within our waters. Um, this is offshore, inshore estuaries, um, and putting that under conservation and working with these um, on the outside of those areas and looking to cons conserve. Everyone is also benefiting from that. So from our side, you know, the big aim across is trying to grow these protected areas, trying 
think put more land under conservation um, and working with people um, to secure these areas. Because um, obviously, you know, our and rowing, um, which makes it, you know, our and puts pressure on these on these escapes. So our role is is basically campaigning um, and creating awareness for the marine space, uh, and working with various stakeholders and government policy to areas and grow it. So we when we started um, at one point, South Africa had only 0.4 percent of our oceans around South Africa that were protected. If you can imagine how small. Um, and, and, and to grow quickly um, to, to protect, you know, marine protected areas are, are, are like an the game reserve where a haven of, of an area where species can Yeah, apologies, folks. Um, just a bit of those technical difficulties with the audio. So once we've sorted it out, we'll get Nicola back and we can uh, get the story loud and clear. But in the meantime, it's back to the action with this uh, giraffe taking its chances with this bull elephant. Seems very relaxed and uh, content with the nice fresh water that's coming out there. Taking his time and hopefully the giraffe has no problems.
No, something that that's always interested me, um, and I've uh, I've been asked it quite a bit as well from guests and viewers. Wh why do we say that an elephant is in must? And this word M U S T H. It's not a particularly English word. Uh, M U S T, sure, but uh, this word is foreign as far as I'm concerned. Um, and uh, it seems like it's actually a late 19th century word um, that it comes from. Urdu or Persian, and it actually means intoxicated. So that is the origins of the word, and obviously you can understand why it's been applied to elephant bulls in these um, sort of uh, hormonal uh, changes. And when that happens, they are intoxicated upon them, as well as on the testosterone that comes with it. So that is the origin of the word must, M-U-S-T-H. Actually, see quite clearly now those toenails on the elephant. No claws, it's actually nails. And sitting up nicely for us there. All right, so we're going to welcome Nicola Gerard back. It seems uh, we've sorted out her audio problems. Hopefully, it goes well this time. Um, and she's from Love Africa Marketing. And just telling us a little bit about what they do. Um, Nicola, what is um, the sort of news from Love Africa? It seems like you guys have been around for 10 years or more. Um, and what's the latest project that you guys are busy with? Hi, Ralph. Um, I hope you can hear me now a little bit better. I'm not too sure what's happening there. Can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Go for it. <laughs> um, yeah, we... Um, the latest project is pretty exciting, actually. Um, I don't know what you got of my last conversation around marine protected areas and us protecting 5% of our general marine space around South Africa. Um, so the latest project is um, a short uh, video and or short film and campaign on 30 by 30. I don't know if you've heard of that before. Um, basically, it's a global conservation target um, that has been set to protect 30% land and ocean by the year 2030 um, and that is to help mitigate climate change and biodiversity and will protect biodiversity um, and so there is a huge global push to protect to or to put land under conservation um, to and to protect our environment so we are working on on a bit of a, a, a video or a film for that. And um, there will be a campaign that will come out um, certainly on the South Africa side for um, in the next few months. And yeah, so we, we went out and we um, we chose a, a, a game reserve called Zerf here in KZN, KwaZulu-Natal. Um, like I said, on the east coast of South Africa and we, uh, they are a, they have been chosen as a case study for for protected area growth, um, where it was a, it's a really beautiful story where it's um, it's twenty thousand hectares, of which over seventy percent was invested by three community trusts, um, 
and with a private uh, donor um, formed a collaboration and a partnership and and basically had the vision to create this game reserve, um, which obviously comes with, um, it's a really good eco model um, in terms of protecting the land and creating um, really good economic support for the area. Um, so this was a really good example of, of public private partnerships. And so in January, we went out into some filming and drove around and you know when your when your film brief says biodiversity um you really are driving around filming dragonflies and frogs to elephants and trees and um and then obviously the tourism model as well in the lodges and um basically that nature-based tourism model so it was a really fun long long day um and then obviously coming back and editing that. And um, it's actually going to be screened at a conference next week. Um, and so, yeah, South Africa is the first country to um, look at a implementation plan for, for protected area growth to try and match that target. So, um, yeah, we're excited to be part of the storytelling around that. Um, I think that our big... Um, one of our big challenges as Love Africa is trying to to create awareness um, and and trying to tell a story on fairly complex issues um, and trying to simplify the messaging to 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 send out to to the public um, and and empower them with knowledge around it. You know, if you don't. Um, if people aren't aware of what's happening around them, then then how can they care? Um, so I think that's our big our big role in terms of all that. That's our that's our driving force um, at the moment. So that's the latest. Um, and then on the far end of the tourism side, uh, beginning of January, we filmed a, a world record uh, abseil uh, ab in Lesotho, um, which is a country within South Africa. Um, so, but again, connecting with nature, um, the, the film was actually called Raging to Nature, and it's about bringing people closer to our elements um, and getting them to appreciate it. Um, so those were the two big projects, um, but lots on the horizon. Well, that's incredible. And um, yeah, I'm going to have to look out for that. What did, what did you say it was? Raging Water. So Raging to Nature, um, which is the short film, uh, we, we produced it with our tourism partners, Simon Kong Lodge, um, which is in Lesotho. And it is a world record abseil next to the Malosonyani Falls, which is the longest single drop uh what's the longest si single drop uh abseil um 196 meters so we did a we did and and we filmed it in um in january and and the water talking to water right now it it was raging there was no other way i can put it it was flooding it was very interesting um conditions to film and we had equipment and a very brave crew that um, we basically threw over the edge of this cliff and said, get the best shots you possibly can. <laughs> and so they, they, um, they descended um, and everyone keeps asking me, have I, did I do it? And yes, I have done it, thank you. Um, it was the craziest thing I ever well did, done. but yes um 200 and yeah yeah it was the falls itself 196 meters and um and it was flooding so we only had we actually only managed to shoot that in one day even though we were there for about five because the water was just too high um and it's basically it was about um you know 
connecting with nature and getting as close to it as you possibly can by abseiling next to the waterfall. And that was the, um, jo Jono, the owner, that was his big thing as to why he did it. So that was one of our short films beginning yeah, in January. Wow, that's incredible and sounds uh, wonderful. Yeah, I'll have to look that up. And I know all too well about abseiling. Those first two meters are the worst. But uh, from that height that you went from, I can only imagine uh, those first two meters must have been uh, pretty horrid. But uh, well done on that. Um, and yes, uh, just a bit of a fun fact about Lesotho. Do you, know that, do you know that it's the country with the highest low point in the world? Meaning that... Uh, the lowest point in Lesotho is over a thousand meters and there's no other country in the world that has that. So it's uh, pretty much a mountainous country, as you mentioned, within the confines of South Africa. And um, great to get some uh, publicity there for the country of Lesotho and the natural areas within that. I've guided in the Tsetlanyani National Park. Um, I led an expedition Thank out you. there. Um, and we went, I can't remember the name of the falls, but there were three falls in conjunction. The one led into the other, and we hiked up next to this. It was absolutely stunning. And obviously, um, a big part of the inspiration of uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's um, Lord of the Rings, being the Drakensberg. Uh, but a lot of South Africans don't even go into Lesotho, so um, great for them to get some, some marketing and some exposure. So fantastic. Yeah, and I see that also you guys, I mean, not only with that kind of uh, video production, but um, doing a lot of marketing strategies and campaign management, uh, social media management, environmental awareness, uh, professional photography, artwork creation, media strategy and press coverage. Wow, so you guys are really encompassing business. Um, and I know too well having my own little tourism company, and I do say little, although I consider myself a specialist in the field, I know how difficult it is to get your name out there and to have your sort of brand pushed out. And, and, and I see that it's great that you are um, really involved with environmental organizations and helping them do exactly that, where they may be the specialists, but um, it's a really sort of busy market um, and uh, lovely that you've uh, you guys have got obviously um, hoops of experience in this field and it seems like you guys are doing great work for all these uh, very important organizations yeah thank you Ralph um, yeah I think we are passionate about the 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 tourism side of things and the wildlife and the conservation side of things um, we, we, you know, I think often it doesn't always come, you know, a lot of the NGOs, the NGO sector, um, and obviously tourism side, especially post COVID, um, it doesn't come with massive budgets or there is always a, some kind of funding or budget issue. So, you know, it's, 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 it's really is trying to, um, and oh, well, just to say that this is the thing, lots of these sort of uh, businesses or organizations come with the best stories, you know, um, and really sort of on the ground grassroots stories that you really want to tell. So we, we do try hard to tell a, a good story um, and try and fit in with the budgets there. Um, so it's, it, it, is a, it, is, it is driven by a lot of passion and um yeah i think um we like i said earlier it's it doesn't really feel like work when it's passion driven um but yeah we work with really really good partners um and you know i think sometimes in the environmental side of things you can sort of look at the news and you look at the headlines and you think gosh everything's falling apart and um, you know, what are people doing, uh, you know, to, to fix everything. And there really is, um, it might not be too obvious every day, but there really are some amazing people and amazing organizations um, doing incredible work behind the scenes um, from on the ground to all the way up to a um, government legislative, legislative point of view. Um, 
so there is definitely hope and i think where where we come from is oh, is is the awareness and 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 basically creating a voice for for these companies because yeah firmly firmly believe in knowledge is power and being being able to create change through awareness and change and behavior change um because i do i do think a lot of the responsibility um rests with with people like you and i um uh, in 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 making these decisions so i think or making change even if it's a small thing so yeah i'm i'm really passionate about uh, bringing these sort of on the ground stories out and finding effective communication tools to do that because um, obviously everything now is film and video and social media and, and trying to tell a good story um, for the online world. Yeah, absolutely. And it sounds like uh, you've got an ice cream van going past you there. Are you going to head oh out for a quick gosh, ice cream? Can you hear that? <laughs> can you actually hear that? I could, I could die. Like, well, I, I hear I'm talking that's what about the question I'm about, sitting in know? Serbia. <laughs> oh no so but yeah i mean coming back to that you know with all these organizations and conservation initiatives etc you know when we studied conservation it, it always boils down to one of the first quotes that we learned when we started was if it pays it stays so, I mean, all of these organizations need to be profitable in some way or another. You can call it a non-profit, but it's always got to be financially viable. Otherwise, they won't, you know, continue to exist. So, and, and that goes from expenses to, to, to paying people to bring their time and, and their, you know, their, their resources, etc. So, I mean, companies like yourselves that are assisting in these marketing strategies and, and implementation of all of these um, uh, uh, different campaigns, I think, I think it's a really important piece of the cog because without it, the, you know, the organizations will cease to exist. Yeah, that's exactly it. I think that's my constant um, battle, um, especially in the, in the sort of NGO environmental side of things where absolutely you need to sort of have have money for the projects on the ground but equally it's ring fencing budget for awareness and communications because um, you know ultimately if people are unaware of what's happening on the ground then how is there going to be a change you know and there is so much amazing so many amazing projects on the ground and people need to know about it um so so yeah i think i think it is a, it is a really really important element and i think you see it more and more now though where um the communications angle is getting is getting its time to shine and, and people are prioritizing and ring fencing um budgets to tell these stories effectively um so it's it's it should it's 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 better than it than it than it used to be um so yeah it must just it must just keep going and and uh, unfortunately yeah it, it is it is tricky because a lot of these you know the film side of things um it's 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 fairly it's it's not a, exactly a, a cheap sort of marketing tool um it does come with need, needed with a slightly heavier budget um but it really is an investment for long-term um, awareness. So, yeah. I think yeah, the ice cream the, guy is gone now. That's it. Well, he's told his story. He's, you're obviously not going for an ice cream, so <laughs> off he goes for the next one. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, I mean, when, when you bring that back and you look at it's, it's sort of how do you, when organizations approach you um, with a conservation campaign um, and, and they want to put it out there to the public, I mean, is, is there a way of selecting that you do um, or choosing which kind of campaigns that you're going to get behind? Or is it just on a, on a ad hoc, um, you know, um, singular level where you, you pick and choose as they come in? Or is there a, a focused strategy from, from your company in picking which guys that you actually um, campaign for? 
Oh, definitely. I think um, I think that well, first of all, from the Love Africa marketing side of things, we um, we do we do get approached, and and I think at the heart of it, we we as a team need to believe in 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 what what the organisation is working towards. Um, we need to believe in 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 the offering or in the project. Um, you know, we we. Um, we w we want to work with with amazing people. So first of all, we do have to choose in a way who we work with, um, and it is such a highly complex. At, at times, the conservation side is such a highly complex industry, um, and so yeah, that's the first thing um, is that we do make sure everybody aligns um, on the vision, uh, and then. It's it's a bit of both. It's ad hoc projects, and then sometimes it's it's sort of long term partnerships where it's a it's a running it's sort of marketing and awareness for for a company. But um, I think with campaigning and environmental awareness, you know, the the common conversation is um, what is the end result? You know, what what are we what are we aiming for in terms of um, are we looking at mass awareness? Are we looking at uh, legislative change? Are we um, looking at trying to get funding? Um, and then it's, you know, often with the stuff that we work on is is all all those levels, and then having different strategies per level. So your members of public, um, how are we going to hit them? Um, what tools are we using? Um, which cities? Um, and then, and where are those people sitting? Are they sitting, uh, are they watching TV, reading newspapers, online, which type of online platform? Um, and, you know, how old is this target market? And, and then it is, you know, generally with, with any kind of marketing, uh, it is choosing key messages. It's, it's choosing one or two very strong messages or strong statements and and driving that hard for as long as possible because i think we all bombarded by messages every day from all over the place um that you really kind of have to choose a refined message and and really drum it hard um for quite a long time um and that's where we got we, we got involved in in film um, on one aspect, it's quite a it's quite a powerful tool to to do that because it gets the message message across quickly and and hopefully emo with a bit of emotion, um, and people hopefully remember it. Um, I don't know if I'm but yeah. So, yeah, and just then for the viewers, if anybody's interested, just to go and have a look at loveafricamarketing.com and uh, have a look at all the clients that are involved with Love Africa Marketing and obviously um, assisting in uh, putting their message out there and um, also exposing their, you know, organizations and what they do. Very interesting in all the different clients that are involved there. So go and check it out, loveafricamarketing.com. So it's really interesting, Nicola. And um, well, is there anything else that you'd like to mention about uh, you know the kinds of work that you guys are doing, um, and specifically related with those clients that you have around water? I think with it being World Water Day, um, then uh, you know uh, if we look at the wild oceans and the ocean impact, uh, I suppose that's a lot to do with all the the marine protected areas. Um, and the improvement of uh, the dismal um, protection areas that we actually do have in South Africa. I know that you touched on it a little bit earlier, but maybe we could go a little bit more in depth with that. Yeah, so we, um, under Wild Trust, like I said, we, we, we are working in collaboration with them uh, with three campaigns. Um, um, and one is Ocean Impact that looks at marine protected areas of which also includes um, estuarine areas, inland lakes, um, growing that protected area space and um, working with governments on spatial planning, 
marketing and that kind of thing. Obviously, we we look at the the communication side of things, and then there is sharks under attack, um, which looks at uh, shark and ray species in particular in our waters. And then a similar con a similar campaign is called. Um, Brink. So it's called On the Brink of Expansion, On the Brink of Extinction. And again, that looks at um, also sort of spanning of these, of these areas. And then the key species in our waters, um, in particular, the shark and, and rays and chimeras. So if we just focus on your big species like sharks, so... so the the big part of that was really creating awareness around um how endangered sharks are um and certain species are and how important our our waters um are in in in, in protecting them um and being a safe haven for for sharks and sharks under attack was really a spin on on, on really how humans are the, are the cause of, of persecution and not the other way around, despite this massive fear that people have for sharks um, and really just going, you know, I think we launched that campaign. Um, we actually looked at um, stats, you know, around playing with stats around how toasters and, 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 and livestock cows are kill more people in a year than than sharks do. Um, and we actually had a we did a short a little short clip actually in, on Durban Beachfront where we um, uh, we wanted to showcase the world's most dangerous predator. Um, and we did a little a little video on that. Um, and really, we had a huge box. A huge cardboard box that we covered with a sheet a black sheet and we put it on the beach and we asked we interviewed people who were walking past and we wanted them to guess what was in the box we wanted them to we want first we asked them what what they thought what the most dangerous predator was and we got everything from snakes to um box crocodiles sharks 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 and um towards the end of the the whole thing or each interview we pulled the black sheets and of course on top of the box was were just mirrors and so people just saw their reflection in the mirror um and so it was more of a realization that we are the cause with overfishing and um targeted fishing and trawling and oil and gas um so just really sort of exploitative use of 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 our waters um so it's that kind of um awareness that we're just trying to create and especially with the youth sort of making simple toning down the message and really um targeting all sorts of people but really um some of these campaigns have a big focus on the youth because that's where it starts doesn't it yeah absolutely and i, and I mean i think it's a it's a massive um it's, um, fear that we have for sharks and it, it, it's it's a crazy fear because um, most people have never even seen a shark in their lives but they're scared to go in the ocean because they may be bitten yeah. by a shark and it's probably a lot derived from television and the likes of Jaws and I did I did hear a story yes. that um, I, I'm not sure if it was the producer or the director or the, the, the story writer of Jaws was actually um, post the movie because of this fear that has been created of sharks now and the indiscriminate um, killing of them now as a result of this um, he's actually been involved in shark conservation and 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 is actually regrets putting this movie out because of the fear that it's created and it's been enormous i mean um, I think it's changed people's perception of the ocean and, and bringing a fear to them. But I, I think we've also got to, you know, think of the reasons why we are having more shark attacks wherever they do occur. 
first and foremost, we have to say that there's more people in the ocean than there ever have been with the population increase. So the statistical chances of more people getting uh, into contact with sharks and potentially being bitten by them has increased massively. So that's just natural. Um, and uh, I just think it's crazy that people are not scared to get in a car. And I mean, if we look at South Africa, we have one of the highest death rates on the road, but um, they're scared of sharks in the sea. And many times I've been going out for a surf and the guys are saying to me, you know, they've driven up into the parking lot and they ask me, aren't you scared of sharks? And I'm like, I just point back at them and I say, I'm more scared of that thing you came in. So and they, they, they normally can't understand it. But um, for me, it's irrational. It's an irrational fear. And from fear, we then obviously, you know, want to murder them, um, which is what generally occurs. Those, that's the one side of it, and obviously, then you're saying the, you know, the fishing and the indiscriminate uh, targeting of um, just random mm. species and the bycatches, obviously, that they get with it. Uh, yes. But it's all as a result of human consumption. Um, so we're all part of the problem. Um, we all have to eat, and we all have to eat a range of uh, different um, food items, and, and fish being one of them. I think we chatted about it yesterday. I think the biggest way that you can help with that is to not buy from the big corporations and rather try to support locals um, who are obviously yes. bringing you fish from the local area. And not only that, it's not uh, that indiscriminate sort of netting of just uh, every species that's in the area. Um, and then those bycatches, which are not allowed to bring onto shore, so they just pretty much dump them overboard um, because of licensing and uh, bureaucracy. So... I think there's many, many pages to this book, but uh, I think at the end of the day, we're all to blame and we all got to look at and help and assist these kind of organizations that you guys are representing um, in trying to conserve, um, you know, the waters, uh, as you say, you know, in the in, in the Sutu, um, in the fresh waters, um, from there to the oceans and just changing people's um, perception uh, of uh, the animals that occur there. That's it. I think, um, you know, just going back to the youth, for example, is, um, you know, the, like you say, the movie industry has really damaged, um, while it has created amazing awareness, it really has um, caused some perception issues. Like, you know, you look at the Lion King and you look at the hyena and you look at the jungle book with the snake and the tiger and you look at just these basic nursery rhymes with the wolf, um, you know, and just at this age, we, we kind of, we're not really helping that perception of, um, of key species. Um, so that all, again, it, you don't realize you, you're creating awareness around these species right from, right, right from a young age. Um, so it's all kind of trying to reverse that and create a, more of an understanding um, and again, with awareness becomes um, knowledge and the, and the power to make better decisions. Um, so, so that's where we have quite a long road to go with um, with the sharks and 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 again, like you say, the marine estuarine side of things. Most people are have it's so it's such a foreign concept. Uh, you know, it's not people that live near the ocean are in touch with the ocean or, or people that are not around water. Um, you know, so it's trying to create awareness inland. Um, so the more you disconnect from it, um, the harder it is to understand. So it's kind of our, our main goal is bringing those messages through to people that um, are, are quite far removed from it. And it's very tricky. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's why Wild Earth is uh, fantastic in, in, in that sort of uh, quest as well, because showing wildlife yes. in a natural environment, um, but not only that, live and not edited uh, or pre-recorded, what you see is what is happening right now. And we've, you know, I think educated a lot of people that had perception-based realities of, of a lot of wildlife. The elephants are scared of mice and uh, that they eat peanuts and you know, all of these kind of random <laughs> things that people learn from television that is uh, completely false. And, you know, ostriches sticking their heads in the sand. 
Um, but it's it's great to get the questions from people and for them to be able to be witnessing, um, even if they're not able to go out into the wilds themselves, uh, to be able to witness this stuff live and then to interact with specialists in the field um, and and getting these uh, you know these perceptions changed um, from what what they they thought was the reality and now being shown as something completely different. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's been unbelievable the wild the wild earth model and 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 basically bringing the bush to to people that wouldn't necessarily have access um, and playing a really really key role in that. I think it is. Um, I think wild earth in particular have done an exceptional job there, um, and the live safaris, of course, is just is is just brilliant. So. Yeah, um, it just I get it just makes me a bit jealous. So I I sit next to the ice cream shops here, and um, I, we do get into the bush as much as we can. But yeah, I, um, watching the sessions and seeing the leopards and the elephants, and while I'm while I'm in my house, it's, it makes me a bit je too jealous, to be honest. Well, sorry for that, but we'll continue on doing the work, as I'm sure <laughs> will you. And, um, well, Nicola, it's been a, an absolute pleasure having you on board. And as a fellow conservation soldier, I wish you all the best um, in your quest and with uh, Love Africa Marketing. And just once again, for anybody that's interested to go and have a look at the lovely work that they do and very important conservation work, I would say, go to loveafricamarketing.com. Nicola Gerard. Thanks very much. You go get that ice cream. Thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, th <laughs> Thanks for having me, Rolf. Thanks, everyone. Cheers, eh? Ciao, ciao. Now, back to our stationary terrapin. He's here at Rosie's Pan in the Olifant's West Game Reserve, which is in the Greater Kruger. And it looks like there's a spot of rain, which is fabulous because uh, we can use all we can get. And with it being water day across the world how more apt could you get a couple of the birds coming into their favorite drinking site on the right hand side here the patillias the mannequins the wax bills the fire finches and of course there we've got a starling as well Sounds like a Cape Scrub Robin, not a Cape Scrub Robin. Uh, I'm thinking now down of the Eastern Cape. A white browed Scrub Robin, I think, is calling. That beep, 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 beep. One of the true songbirds, um, as are all the robins. And uh, they're the ones that make real tunes. So whenever you hear a bird that's making a, a wonderful tune, it's, it's actually literally a song. Those are, you can normally... Uh, sort of go towards the robins where they are the sort of perfect song masters and so a nice way to get you towards that when you're trying to identify a bird just by its call. There's a chin spot batters uh, with a partial call. He's going chin spot. He's not doing the batters, but that's him calling.
Oh, Terrapin's decided to change off position. Is he going to plop back into the water or is he just going to turn around? Let's see. Maybe he's got his solar panels. They're fully charged. He might be off for a bit of foraging. So we haven't had the luck of the Irish today, there hasn't been any predators around, albeit it is uh, overcast and a little bit drizzly, so there is still a good chance, maybe we'll get a last minute leopard, who knows. But uh, does bode well for the naturalists out on the sunset safari, the predators may be active a little bit earlier than usual with it being cooler. So just zoning in on one of our very common residents around all the different waterholes, I don't think there's one waterhole that there isn't a blacksmith lapwing, and normally in pairs, but they uh, seem to be the guardians of the edge of all the waterholes. You can hear the little blue wax bulls calling. Lapwing got himself something, but didn't quite like it. Now that kind of whap 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 I think is a white crown trike, if I'm not mistaken. Can't see it, just heard it. And I'm pretty sure a white crown shrike. In the Newman's book, I always like looking up how they describe the bird calls, and they describe the white crown shrike um, as uttering a curious quep quep sound. So, uh, going on that, I'm pretty sure that, that was a southern white crown shrike. And it's also quite interesting that in Afrikaans, they actually call it a creme tart laksman, which is a cream tart hangman, which is the direct translation, because all of the shrikes obviously being laksman in Afrikaans. And once again, if I'm not mistaken, I do believe it's a, a hangman. Um, so he's the cream tart hangman, because he does look a little bit like, or have the colors of cream tart.
So unfortunately, heading towards the end of the show, but uh, as one door closes, another opens, and you'll be heading on to the Sunset Safari. So don't go anywhere. There'll be lots of action coming your way. As I say, a little bit overcast in the greater Kruger area, so who knows? Maybe those predators will be nice and active. That's what I'm hoping for, and, um, well, I'm sure the guys will do their best. Let's hope they find lots of spots and lots of hyenas, wild dogs, lions, maybe even a cheetah. Who knows? Maybe you'll see three. What about that? But, um, yeah, thanks for joining us, folks. I hope you've all enjoyed the discussions, especially around Love Africa Marketing and all those wonderful organizations that they represent. Go and have a look. And, um, well, once again, we'll be back again at it tomorrow at 1 o'clock. So we hope to have you back once again and firing away with your questions and comments. And who knows what the African bush is going to bring to us once again. You never can tell. The only constant, as they say, is change. Well, that's it from me for now, folks. Enjoy the rest of your day, and especially the Sunset Safari. Bush greetings. Cheers. Hello, hello, and welcome, everyone. My name is Amy, and of course, behind the camera with me is Paul. And we are here to discuss the highlights of the last 24 hours. This is On Safari.